as in the art case, is define what we mean by morality and then go out in the world and measure what it is that corresponds to, or whether anything corresponds to those definitions or not. Um, now, let me give just one example of how you could do this. Let's say, just for the sake of illustration, you define morality or, or uh, moral goodness the way that Sam Harris does, as promoting the well-being of conscious creatures. Well, you could provide a definition of consciousness, and you could define well-being in terms of a particular set of brain states, and voila, that's a scientific question now. That's a question about quarks and electrons in the real world. That's uh, a question about which there can be objective facts. It's an objective, it might be really hard to get the answer, but it's an objective fact of the world whether or not um, abortion tends to promote the well-being of conscious creatures. There's an objective fact in the world, in the natural world, about whether capitalism or communism better tends to promote the well-being of conscious creatures. There's an objective fact of the world about whether female genital mutilation tends to promote the well-being of conscious creatures. And notice it doesn't depend on human opinion at all, because even if, say, the Nazis had won World War II and brainwashed all of us to think that killing non-white people is okay, even in that case, it would still be an objective fact of the world that killing non-white people would not tend to promote the well-being of conscious creatures. So these are objective facts that we could go out and measure in the world, and they don't depend on human opinion at all. But now, I think the question is going to be, but why go with that definition of morality? Because you hear me say that, and you say, OK, look, I get it. If you define morality with this set of definitions, then we can go out into the world and measure what it is that corresponds to these definitions and what properties they have and what's morally right or wrong according to that set of definitions. And we could define morality this way, and then we could go out into the world and measure and do the science of figuring out what's morally good or bad on that set of definitions. But that's not what I came here for. I want to know what's really right, what's really wrong, what's the set of definitions that we should be using. That's what we want to know. That's what I want to know. And there's two ways I'm tempted to answer that question. The first way goes like this. I want to say, I'm sorry. That's not the way language evolved. There is no one true theory of morality. There is no one true set of definitions. Uh, moral language, moral discourse, has been the product of millions of human beings over thousands of years having very different theories about morality, and there's all kinds of different senses of morality. So think about it and get over it, and then if you want, uh, participate in doing the science of morality. Go out there and measure what it is that tends to promote the well-being of conscious creatures, or whatever set of facts you want to investigate. That's not very satisfying, I know, but it might be correct. <coughs> But there is a second way that I'm tempted to respond to this question. And it's a little bit more sympathetic. Um, I don't think there's going to be one true theory of morality, because that's not how language works. But there might be something like the one most universal definition of morality. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, if I came up here and gave a lecture on how gravity was a manifestation of the curvature of space-time, and I spoke about that for 30 minutes, and then at the end I said, well, thank you for listening to my lecture on moral theory, you would all be very confused or maybe angry, and rightly so, because it's just not useful to suddenly redefine all the terms to refer to things that they never referred to before, right? I can't just, so there are some things that are more about morality than other things. And what you could do is you could try to find what moral theory best captures or has an account of the assumptions of our usual moral discourse. Because there are a lot of assumptions that go into our moral discourse. We're always talking about praise and condemnation and uh, prohibited actions, forbidden actions, uh, obligatory actions, permissible actions, actions that are above and beyond the call of duty. Um, we're talking about normative reasons, all these different types of things. And so what you could do is look for a theory that has a, an account of all those different types of assumptions that go into moral discourse. And that theory would be more about morality than any of the other theories out there. So this is kind of abstract. What's the, what's the picture that I'm promoting here? We've got all these moral theories, 
all these philosophers doing all this work, all these moral theories. The first most obvious step is to just narrow the range or narrow our focus to the ones that make only true claims. Because the vast majority of moral claims like make lots of false claims about things we have no evidence for, like um, intrinsic value or, or deities, uh, or maybe categorical imperatives, maybe that won't be justified. Uh, so that's the first step, is just narrow our focus on the moral theories that make only true claims. And then we could pick the one from among those that has the best, ca captures best as many assumptions of our moral discourse as possible. And that would be more about morality than any of the other true theories. And that would be one way to go. That would be maybe not the one true theory of morality, but maybe the one most universal theory of morality. Now, you couldn't have a true moral theory that um, I captured everything that goes into our assumptions and our moral discourse for two reasons. The first reason is that different uh, cultures and, and uh, believing cultures uh, have conflicting, like literally contradictory assumptions in their moral discourse, so you can't accommodate them both. And the other problem is that a lot of moral discourse has assumptions that are just false, like assumptions about gods. And so you can't account for everything, but you can account for more of the assumptions of moral discourse than any of the other theories that make only true claims. And then you would have the one most universal theory of morality that also happens to be true. So then if we did that, and we did the science of morality, we could finally have a science of morality, like 2,500 years after Socrates asked, what is the good life? Now, what is the main benefit if we decide to develop a science of morality? I think the main benefit is that we can finally come to know and agree on moral facts. And here's what I mean by that. Think about how most of us make our moral judgments about whether something is right or whether something is wrong. I think most of us, what we do is we kind of close our eyes and think about whether stealing music off the internet is right or wrong, and we, we feel that it's right or we, we feel that it's wrong, and that's how we do our moral judgment. We follow the advice of Jiminy Cricket. We let our conscience be our guide. Probably the advice of our mothers as well. And that's one way to go about it, but I think it's really problematic for at least three reasons. The first reason is that it turns out to be culturally relative. This is the same strategy that was used by people 200 years ago when everybody uh, accepted the legitimacy of slavery and racism and sexism and homophobia, things that we mostly reject now. Um, so if, you, if you're looking inside to your inner feelings and your inner intuitions about what's right and wrong, it's very often going to be corrupted by accidents of culture. And so your intuitions are going to end up being kind of fickle in that way, and very culturally accidental. The second reason is that it just doesn't make any sense evolutionarily. Um, there's no adaptive purpose for a module in the brain that can detect moral value in the world. And even if we did have evidence that we had such a module in the brain, um, we, our moral opinions differ so much around the world that even if we have a moral module, it's obviously extremely faulty because we disagree so much, so it shouldn't be trusted anyway. And then the third reason is that, uh, again, our, our intuitions are very fickle, and I have just four examples of this. And most of this comes out of the last 10 years of research in, in experimental moral psychology. Um, one study showed that, uh, let's say I'm a researcher and I walk up to you on the street and I say, hey, I've got a, a, a survey about morality. Would you like to participate in a, in a survey? It'll just take a minute. And you say, sure, fine. And so I say, I'm holding a warm cup of coffee, and I say, hey, would you hold on to this for a second? And I hand you the cup of coffee, and I grab my thing down here, and I say, thanks, and I take my cup of coffee back. Because you held that cup, warm cup of coffee for two seconds, when you fill out the survey, you will now make more generous moral judgments than if I had not handed you the cup of coffee. That's what happens when we do that study. So our moral intuitions, our moral judgments are greatly affected by whether or not you were holding a warm cup of coffee for two seconds. Really surprising, but really fickle for our moral intuitions. Uh, another one is kind of similar. If you're in the presence of uh, freshly baked bread, again, when you fill out the survey and you look at all these different scenarios described on the survey, you'll make more morally generous uh, uh, judgments about the situations than if you're not in the presence of freshly baked bread. 
These are things that affect our moral judgments, but we would never use them as a justification. You would never say, oh, well, I think this was, uh, this was permissible um, because um, I'm smelling freshly baked bread. You would never give that as a justification, but it is what's actually causing a significant uh, part of our moral judgments. Another one, kind of the opposite one, there's a novelty product that you can buy at uh, certain stores called fart spray, which smells like flatulence. And uh, researchers did this study where they sprayed some fart spray in one room and didn't spray it in another room. And then they invited everybody in to take this survey. And in fact, the fart spray in this room was not even large, it was not even strong enough that you could even tell. Um, they asked them afterward if you smelled anything unusual.